Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. The title of this morning's message is Environments Matter. Environments Matter, okay? Just like that environment, man, that's just a beautiful environment for God, the sower, the farmer, the gardener to do his work, amen? Before we get into the message, uh, just let me, a couple of announcements. One, the admin building, appreciate you guys um, sowing and giving, and so we're making progress in that. So for those of you who don't know, somebody had said, told us that they would match, if the congregation would give $20,000 towards the admin building to restore it, they would match it with another 20000 So we're about 4000 or so away from that, and so we just need you to dig a little bit deeper. Because I want him to, ma- I want him to obey his the word and match the twenty. Okay, <laughs> I need his twenty. He needs to write a check out today. So um, I did another four hundred. Okay, so I want you to match mine. I challenge you in Jesus' name. All right. So, anyways, <laughs> uh, let's do that because we we're we're making progress and it's very important to us. The second thing I wanted to say is that thank you guys for the survey. We did a, a sermon topic survey. You, anybody get that? Several of you guys responded, and I wanted to give you the top three results that we found out of that sermon survey, because we'll we'll be addressing some of those things uh, in this last quarter of the year. The top top topic was finding God's purpose for my life, God's will for my life. 38% plus, uh, you guys responded with that. And that's usually, honestly, that's usually always the case. People want to know what God's purpose is for their life. But let me just tell you this. That if you want God's purpose for your life, you're going to have to dig a little bit. We're talking about dirt. You're going to have to dig a little bit in that dirt. Because why would he give you something so precious if you don't position yourself to actually follow through and become a full-fledged follower? Amen. And so we'll look at some of those things. Actually, we'll talk about some of those things in this series, I think. The second top thing was spiritual warfare. And you know that old dirty devil. Right, But we talked about that, and that usually comes around, it cycles around constantly, and Joel said, I don't want to touch that subject, because you touch that subject. It's like, okay, I'll touch that subject. Here's the thing you need to know about spiritual warfare. One, the devil's defeated. God's given you authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. You don't need to be afraid of any demonic influence. We have authority over him, amen? But you have to understand that there is a war going on. There is a battle that we face, and we have to contend with, right? We have to take our ground, and you can't let him just shame you and cause you to just, there's an inner critic that he's constantly prodding, and he's constantly just nagging at you. And so we'll address some of those things as well. And then the last thing was a really interesting, current events and end times, and that's old as dirt, okay? So I'll let you all address that. What I mean by that is that it doesn't matter what current trends are and what events are taking place. We've seen it comes back and it cycles through constantly over and over and over again, even since the times of Jesus. And so people ask me all the time, preach on the tribulation. I'm like, you know what? Here's my approach for tribulation. It doesn't matter if you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, no-trib, you're in the trib. Whatever it is, are you ready? Are you ready? Have you positioned, have you cultivated your life in such a way that regardless of what happens and how it comes, you are, you have a true north. Okay. And no, so that's a very easy subject for me, but people want to hear other things. I'll let Pastor Joel address that because he's smarter than I am. All right. Now, the title of this morning's message, you guys good, is environments matter. Man, I haven't talked to you guys in such a long time and I'm so excited today. I have to be careful with my time, though. Environments matter. And the big idea is this, is that your context, how you position yourself, where you position yourself, the environment that you're in, as a matter of fact, the the, the environment that you just came out of in the parking lot or at your house will determine how much you will receive today's message. If you had an expectancy, it's like, man, I can't wait to go to church. You know, I can't wait. And my kids are like, I can't wait to go. They created this environment of expectancy. I mean, they're going to receive. But if you just walked out of this place in the parking lot, like, come on, woman, you crazy woman. Whatever. (laughs) Anybody been there before? (laughs) Don't raise your hands. (laughs) It's not true. Uh, That type of environment is, you know, your environment affects the receptivity 
of God's word and God's spirit speaking to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. The setting of your soil determines the health of your garden, period. Let me explain it this way from Psalms, the first chapter. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor does he even stand. In other words, he's aware of his environment. He is not going to put himself in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in, this, in, in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. The environment he chooses to ra- surround himself in is uh, in the law of the Lord, keeping the word of God before him. And in that space, he meditates it day and night. That man will bear fruit. His leaf will not wither. And whatever that man does, because he positions himself in that place, he'll prosper. Good. Environments matter. Amen? Your environment matters. So, you know, a few years ago, well, a couple of years ago, Actually, it's been a little bit longer. I planted a couple of trees, a couple of oak trees. My wife's uh, mom, my mother-in-law passed away. How long has it been, man? 2015. 2015. So that's, man, that's been that long? Yeah. Wow. I just thought it was a couple years ago. Anyways. And um, I planted a tree on behalf of my mom also that just passed away. So I planted these trees, or I had one of them planted professionally, and I planted the other one. Now, in the backyard of my house... I, have, I, had an, I, I had an above ground pool. I had a guy come over and dig four feet, you know, a hole, a big hole, so that I could set that pool, you know, inside of it, so it looked like a, like a real pool. <laughs> we kept it, man, I hated it. I liked it and I hated it, all right? I liked it for about a month. And then after that, I was like, man, I hate this pool. So one day I was cleaning this thing. After a couple years, I was cleaning it out, and it was only about six inches left of water. And I didn't pay attention to the weather that, that evening. Well, a big old storm came. And when the storm came, it, there was so much rain that it caved in all the walls of that swimming pool. And all the, 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 the what do you call it, the walls on that thing just all caved in. And there was just a bunch of dirt down there. Now, I could have gotten dirty and, you know, got all that thing and fixed it all back up. But I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> And so I buried that thing with the poles, with frogs, with everything. It's like there's all kinds of stuff underneath there. And I put dirt on that. I packed it all up, and I planted grass, and it was beautiful. And so Natalie's mom's tree, I was like, I'm going to plant a tree right there. Knowing that there was just a bunch of stuff under I was just curious if it would grow. I think it would grow, but I don't know. It's just all I see is dirt, but I know what's underneath that dirt. So we planted that sucker. And man, it's beautiful. It's given, you know, it's squirrels are coming, raccoons are here, and birds and cardinals. I got, you know, bees coming all the time. Not bees, but what do you call those little animals, the hummingbirds coming all the time. It's beautiful. So mom passes. So I was like, man, I've got the perfect place for mom and my sister's uh, trees. I got a couple of crepe myrtles and another oak tree for, on behalf of my mom. And these guys, professionally, they came. They came and got their tractor. It was on the, on, on the west side of the house perfectly in the center of it, because when it grows, it's going to give a shade, and it's, you know, it has an irrigation system, there's sprinklers out there, and they planted it, and it started to grow. I started seeing green, and then I saw all of a sudden it started withering. It's like it started turning bad. It's like, what the heck? what's going on here? And then green would come back. This is over a period of months, right? I'm watching it all the time. Put rocks around it, because I would sit there and just meditate and talk to birds, talk to the earth, whatever. And so it started blossoming again. And then here the, during this last drought, man, this thing just told all the leaves were brown. It was nasty. And I'm going over there. I can, I can literally break twigs off of this tree. And I got a spade and, and I started messing around. And I looked down there and it's like all these ants, all these animals, it just like the whole root system was dry and rotted up. I'm like, what the heck? What's wrong with these things? So I just flooded it with water. I put... You know, I put, uh, what do you call that, fertilizer stuff. I put miracle growth, yes, because my mom used to do all that. My mom used to speak to, that, to the trees and plants. So I'd start speaking to moms like, mom, stop struggling. <laughs> and I think it's dead. I think it's dead, honestly. It hadn't grown back. And so I'm just waiting for it. Maybe a miracle will take place or something. But the point is that the environment under both of those trees mattered. This one was struggling, but it wasn't until I saw what was underneath it that I understood that probably something's happening here that I don't see. And maybe you're in here and in this space in your life and you're struggling or you're stuck or you're struggling. It could be 
not the person that you're living with. It could be something in your environment. It could be something in your dirt that you have to contend with. So we are going to break ground this morning with this particular message. So let's get our hands dirty. Let's dig up some dirt. But I want you to say this because I'm going to try to drill this statement in your heart. God does his best work in the dirt. Can you say that with me? God does his best work in the dirt. God does his best work in the dirt. Always. You know, Pastor Joel would talk about our therapist, or my therapist anyways, it's a, you got to learn from Marcus. He understands the clouds. I don't know if I understand the clouds or not. I understand the dirt, though, because I've been there many a times. It's in those, what I call, sacred spaces of the dirt that he's tilling, that he's cultivating, that he's creating things, and he's exposing things, and he's helping me. And it's not always bad or negative. Sometimes it's like, hey, keep that nutrient there in your life always. Keep doing that constantly. Make sense? He goes, and so, so we're going to dive into this idea because God does his best work. Actually, C.S. Lewis says this. It's when we notice the dirt that God is most present in us. It's the very sign of his presence. I love that. When you take a look at the dirt like Jeremiah was talking about, you know, you're never as close as you are to God until the things are exposed. All of a sudden you're there, right, Bill? We talked about some of the testimony that he has in, in re-engage. It's like in that space where usually it would be meant to bring shame by the enemy, it brought him closer and it brings us closer to the very presence of God. Um, he, uh, John Muir says it this way, of all the paths that you take in life, make sure that a few of them are dirt. I love that. Here's what I know about dirt. Here's my dirt theology. You and I all came from the dirt. We're all going to wind up at the end in the dirt. And the, the struggle or the tension that we do throughout all of our lives is that we have to face our dirt constantly. Amen? And so we're going to take a look at that. And you have to be careful. And you have to, here's, what, here's what I want you to understand is that in, in the dirt, when, when he's cultivating and tilling, what he says and what you hear and how you respond to that is so very important. See, here's what I know about all of us. We all want to produce. Yeah. Especially him. <laughs> we all want to prosper. We all want to be successful. We all want to be strong. We all want to yield a good crop, right? Just like the rich, the rich young ruler that we find in Scripture. Man, he thought he was all that and a bunch of good stuff. He was rich. He had wealth. He was young. He had authority. He had power. Until the, he came across with the tiller, with the master farmer, with the master gardener. And it was in that space with the master that he began to identify some things in his dirt, his self-reliance, his covetousness, his greediness. And he didn't want to do anything with that, so he just took off. He had an opportunity to respond, but he didn't. He is constantly working in the dirt, and he works his best work in the dirt. How you respond to what he is speaking to you in that space matters. Does that make sense? Parable of the sower. Mark the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 20. I love this parable. Um, this is a principle I've taught for years. Uh, not necessarily two congregations, even though I have, but it's something that he's drilled in my heart. So there's a bunch of great principles that we're going to find to help you succeed, help you position yourself in, a, in the best possible way to, to flourish in your life. So let me have your ears. Por favor. Let's talk about la tierra, okay? <laughs> Sandwiched in between this parable is one of the most beautiful truths that you have to recognize. And that's what I'm going to address today. And this idea is this. Pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to what you hear. Uh, the parable, for those of you who are new to your faith in Christ, basically just a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, okay? And so Jesus, whenever he taught, uh, you know, he used an agricultural system to illustrate truth. Pastor Joel talked a little bit about this last week. He didn't use a social system. 
a man-made system. You know why? Because you can manipulate a man-made system. You can manipulate a social system. You can take shortcuts, right? Anybody ever cram for a test? Like you've been sitting there the whole quarter, the whole semester, not really even paying attention to that teacher, but man, come test time, you're like cramming all the stuff in. Then you ace the test or you pass it. One week later, did you learn anything? What'd you learn? I don't know. I don't know anything. Why? You, you manipulated it. My daughter was a, an amazing manipulator of the system. She would sleep most of the time, but whenever she would test, and she would ace it. It's just like your mom. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so he always used an agricultural system. Why? Because you can't take shortcuts with what we call the law of the farm. You plan, you cultivate. You get it ready, you till it, you sow, fertilize it, you water it, harvest comes. You cannot short circuit that system. And so whenever he's teaching, this is the first parable that he addresses. And and, and actually later on he says, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand the rest of it. Because what you're going to see in this parable is the key to understanding one, life principles and the rest of what you're going to hear from me later on. And so it's very, very important. And when you look at this, he's talking about dirt. I usually would call this law of the farm, but Jeremiah said, let's just call it dirt. Like, okay, country boy, let's call it dirt. (laughs) I told Levi, I was like, dude, can we sing dirty deeds, done dirt cheat? Anyways, there's all kinds of things that came in my head. Let me stay focused here. All right. Now, verse one. Again, he began to teach by the sea. And the great multitude was gathered to him, talking about Jesus. He gets into the boat. He sits on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. I mean, I love the master teacher. We, we were down in, in Israel. And the, w- when we went down to the Sea of Galilee, I, I knew and recognized, I didn't recognize it, but I knew that this was the area where he probably taught this. They call it the Sower's Cove. We couldn't see it where we were at, but around a little bit further down, that was the space they say that that's where he taught this parable. And it's just this is cove, and it, and it creates a really perfect amphitheater. So the master teacher is actually setting the, the environment of the individuals who were there to hear. There's multitudes there in that space. And in the backdrop, you can see all the, the farmland and the, the cultivation and all these different things. And he positions himself there. He goes out into the boat and he's facing all these multitudes that were on the land facing him. And at verse 2, it says, He taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen! This is the first part of the bread. Listen, pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to what you're hearing. Remember, he is the master teacher, right? Listen, a sower went out to sow. That's what sowers do. They sow. Roosters crow, dogs bark, sowers sow. Side thought. Men, you and I are sowers. Women, you're most looked at as a field to receive. Gentlemen, it's very important for us how you sow and what you sow in your home. That's another subject, okay? We'll talk about that later. But he says, a sower goes out to sow. And it happened, verse 4, he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. Birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. Different soil, different dirt. Different scenarios, right? You guys with me? Okay. Are you listening? Okay. Then some seed, verse 7, fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and they choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seed fell on the good ground and yielded a crop, and it sprang up. It increased and produced some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. I love what he said in verse 9. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him Hear. We all have ears, but only a few have ears that hear. Right? He who has ears to hear. In other words, if it was T.G. Jakes talking to you, he'd say it like this Are you listening to me? 
course. At Crossroads here, we say this. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? What we're really saying goes, are you getting this? Are you listening to me? Does that make sense, right? And actually, he's referencing, uh, he who has ears to hear, he's referencing a, a passage of scripture in Isaiah, the, the sixth chapter, 60-something, chapter, I don't remember. But he's referencing that because the, the prophet is talking to individuals who were dull of hearing. They were ignoring God's word, and they were just setting it aside. And so he was like, hey, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because he's speaking to his plants. He's the gardener. He's the sower. Johnny Harrell back here, years ago, he would tell me, he goes, Marcus, the key to growing your plants is to speak to it because they hear. I'm like, Johnny, you're crazy. <laughs> but actually, I would hear my mom do that always. I'd wake up and I would hear her voice. Oh, good morning, beautiful. Good morning, sunshine. I was like, well, who's she talking to? Who's here at seven in the morning and six in the morning? <laughs> and I'd go around and she's singing or talking to the plant. Hey, beautiful, you look so good this morning. I'm like, what the, what's wrong with mom? We've got to put her in the hospital or something. But man, she had a green thumb. Everything she touched was, was I mean, you, dad would try to weed eat the stuff outside and it would just come back up. She'd go back out there and just speak to it. It's amazing. Actually, just, anyways, um, bottom line, he's saying, are you paying attention? So he, 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 he sows the seed and then he sets himself aside by himself with the disciples and those who were with his disciples, and he begins to fertilize. He begins to till. He begins to cultivate. He begins to go a little bit deeper to position them to succeed, to give them understanding of what actually he just sowed, and only to a few. Why? Because he knows that these individuals, they're ignoring him. They came in. Just to appease, they're just have itching ears. But he sets these guys aside. It's almost like there's a reserved seating for these individuals. Notice what he says when he was alone, those around him, with him, with the 12, asked about this parable. And he said to them, To you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. I love what Pastor Joel said last week. When you buy into the treasure of God's word, hold on to it. Hold fast to it. Don't just let it out. Let it nurture. Let it just produce. Let it begin to cultivate your heart. My pastor would always tell me, the message that I share on Sunday morning, I would take it home. I would just, I didn't want to go out to lunch. I didn't want to go out and hang out with all the crazy people. I would go home and I would re-listen and re-teach myself what exactly I was getting from that passage of scripture. And I would just let it just burrow itself in my soul. And in that space, the farmer would cultivate and would expose certain things that I needed to address. And I think that was the reason why I am just where I'm at in life. It's because I'd allowed his word to change these crazy thinking patterns that I've had so many years in my life. Make sense? And that's exactly what he's doing. And he says to them, he goes, to you, it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. In other words, he goes, listen, you made a commitment to me to follow me, to leave everything behind and follow me. I'm making a commitment to you to coach you, to mentor you, to till the soil, to sow the seed, to watch produce fruit. It's beautiful. I love how he does this. He goes, but to those who are outside, to those who are strangers, to those who have hardened their hearts, to those who are just here just by fly by night, he goes, to them who are outside, all things come in parables. So that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest, and I love how God always, even though he knows these individuals, the motivations and why they're there, he always gives them an opportunity to turn or to listen, to obey, and to make the adjustment lest they turn and their sins would be forgiven. You know, you and I have an opportunity to be actively involved in our growth patterns, right? Lest they turn, lest you turn. All of a sudden, what if that seed just sows? It's like, it breaks something. It's like, you know what? I'm going to make, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go all in. 
We see that so often. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I went all in. Yeah. Yeah. I turned. Even though I didn't know what I was turning to. All I knew is that whatever it was was in this book. And I needed to find out what the heck is in this book. Because it's transforming my life. It's transforming my thinking. God, God does his best work in the dirt. You have to understand the whole process. is not understand all the agriculturals, the system, all that stuff. But here's what I do know. That inside every seed, this word is, is, is the seed, the seed of God's word. He sows that. And every single seed, there's a blueprint inside of every seed. That blueprint will produce. That blueprint contains the image of the master creator who put that blueprint in there in the first place. And if it's sowed properly, if it's sowed in the right environment, eventually that seed has to break. In order for, for that to be watered, because that outer shell, it's, it's meant for, for protection. You can't, pen it, you can't put water in it. But it's only in the dirt, in that dark space, that that outer portion needs to break. And the water and the fertilization of God's spirit begins to do the miracle. It's like, how do you throw this thing inside and all of a sudden it starts springing stuff up? I don't understand that. Only God knows that. But the process is that seed, the outer casing has to break somehow. And it has to yield itself to the nurturing of the master gardener. And then it's got to press through. It's got to press through the dirt. Any you guys been, ever been swallowed by dirt? Like, have you ever been under a dirt pile? Good. You wouldn't be here probably. <laughs> I mean, it's, it takes effort. You got to push through these things. And then all of a sudden, you'll, if, you're, if you're willing to endure and stay steady and let the process go, you'll see fruit. You will grow. You will develop. It's in your marriage. It's in your business. It's in your ministry. It's in every aspect of your life. When I started this church, by the grace of God, I was already 20-something years in ministry. When I said yes to come back to Seguin, the Spirit of God told me, he goes, you've just entered into your first phase. I'm like, what the snappers? <laughs> what was all this stuff? I was tilling. I was working. I was work he was working in my heart and my soul. Growing, growing developing. If I'd have started this church when I was a teenager or in my early 20s, I wouldn't be here today. There's no way because crazy people are around here. <laughs> and I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. But the tension point in every, in, in the process is this. In that sacred place or in that dark space, if you just take the time, like what we did this morning in worship, just sitting in that space was beautiful. And in that space, what are you hearing? Are you even listening? And more than that, are you willing to yield to what you're hearing? Are you willing to allow that process to work? Take advantage of the tiller when he speaks, amen? As a matter of fact, Job, the 12th chapter, I remember it says, speak to the earth. Speak to the dirt. Speak while you're in there because it'll instruct you. It'll show you some things, right? As a matter of fact, in, in Luke's gospel of this same particular parable, this is when Jesus tells him, he goes, blessed are you, are your eyes who see and your ears who hear. People of old, they've desired to hear what you hear and see what you see. And so the master, when he's speaking, it's, it's an invitation to help you grow and develop so that you can produce here on this earth. Amen? And he said to them in verse 13, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, he's just saying, the key to your victory in life is found in this parable. You want fruit? You got to deal with the root. Period. You've got to look at the root system. You've got to look at your environment. You've got to be like Jacob. Remember Jacob? Jacob had contention with God. Jacob said, hey, we're going to wrestle. He wrestled in the dirt with God. 
And I love that because in that, in that space when he was wrestling with God, God, all he was trying to do was like point, point, point out the fact that, who are you? He said, who are you? And he finally had to admit, it's like, you know what? I'm Jake, I'm a deceiver. I'm always trying to pull people, you know, behind so I can get ahead. What was he doing? He was tilling, he was cultivating. You can wrestle with God in the dirt. You're not going to win. You might walk out, and you're going to walk out with a limp, but you're going to be better for it, I promise you. Amen. You'll be better for it, amen? And so all of a sudden, Jesus shares this with the disciples. Then he begins to explain what the parable is. So he, he gives them his dirt theology, all right? And it goes something like this. Verse 14 goes, the sower sows the word, and these are the ones that were by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. You and I have an enemy and the enemy's number one goal is to abort this process, right? To destroy that seed. He goes on to say in 16, likewise, you're the ones on the stony ground. When they hear it, immediately they receive it with gladness. Like, yay, I'm an emotional Christian. But they have no root in themselves. They only endure for a time. And afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. You know what? It takes time and patience to get rooted and grounded. It just takes time. We'll talk about that, either myself or Pastor Joel. Joel's going to be doing the last three of this series. But it takes time to develop a good, strong root system. In verse 18, he goes, Now these are the ones that are sown among the thorns. They're the ones who hear the word, the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things choke the word and becomes unfruitful. It never fails. This is cycles all the time. The cares, the cash, and the cravings will eventually destroy your harvest. We'll talk about that. Is that okay? Then in verse 20, it says, these are the ones now who are sown on good ground. Those who hear it, they accept it, and they bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Hearing, accepting, and adjusting is the key to your victory. That's how you produce. And that's the end of that parable. But it's not over. Wait, for $9.99? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, he's going to throw the other piece of bread now in this sandwich. He, this is the most important part. Sorry, it's only three minutes till 10. This is when he gets his, 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 his deep spade. You ever seen that spade where it's got like 16-inch forks on there, blades? He digs it in. He starts moving it around to just shake that soil. This is what he does. He's, he says to them, is the lamp to be brought under the basket and under the, or under the bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there's nothing hidden that will not be revealed, nor anything been kept secret that it should not come to the light. Again, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. What's he saying? He goes, don't you dare hide what I'm exposing in that space. What I'm addressing in that space, don't bury that thing. That was meant to be brought to the light for a reason. Your environment matters. He goes on to say, uh, in, in the next verse, he said to them, take heed what you hear. You see that? Are you listening to me? You get it? I don't know if you get it or not. He goes on to say, with the same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. You who hear, more will be given. Whoever has to him, more will be given. But whoever doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away. The measure of your yielding determines the measure of your harvest. Period. Pay attention to what you hear. And when he speaks in those beautiful places, uh, you can respond in one of two ways. It can either fall on deaf ears, just like it did in those of old, or it could prick something positive, and it's like you're all ears, you're all in. Then you make adjustments. So let me encourage you for the next few weeks. Come, not that you don't already, Come expecting to hear. Come expecting to hear what the Spirit of God wants to do in our lives. The context of your parenting, the context of your marriage, the context of your... Whatever context that is, I promise you, 
These principles will work. Why? Because it's the law of the farm. They will work in every context of your life. So just come expecting. And I want to close this morning with a statement from little Johnny. Something that he said is very, very important. Little Johnny finds himself at the farm milking his cow. He's sitting there in the bucket's there and he's ready to milk that thing. And while he's milking it, this fly and this bug starts swirling around the cow's head. And it goes straight into his ear and straight into the can, spits out into the can. And he turns around to his audience and he says, don't let what I tell you go in your ear and out the udder. <laughs> what do we do with this? Let me give you application because I always do. Because we're talking about hearing. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to practice hearing. I want you to practice hearing. Just take a picture of that if you want. But here's, here's what I encourage you to do. Maybe two or three times this week. Just do this. It's real simple. You can do it in five minutes, 10 minutes. 30 minutes. You can literally do it in five minutes. Read a passage. Read a passage of scripture. Whatever passage that is. Matthew 6, whatever. Out of that passage, circle one phrase or one word. Just circle it. Because that's, that. all of a sudden it's just coming out. It's, all, it's almost like an invitation. So circle that. And then just write one action point. And you can do it like this. Today I will blank and then write a simple prayer. Father, I thank you this. Let me give you an example. I think I'll put an example on here, right? Do that next slide. For instance, here's a passage. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I circled thy kingdom and thy will. My action today, I'm gonna put your will above mine at work. And my prayer was, Lord, thank you for giving me the strength I need to put you first at work today. Help me to harness my mouth. That's it. Why do I want to do that? It's because you get, you, when you start developing a habit of doing this, you start developing a habit of hearing. You, you, you go to his word because God usually speaks through his word. He's already speaking. He's sowing his word into our hearts. You highlight that thing. It's almost like an invitation. And then just get used to doing that. Next thing you know, you'll hear his voice. It's like, oh yeah, I remember that passage. The Holy Spirit is here to remind you of the things that Jesus has spoken. That's how he speaks. We're not hearing, oh, Marcus, go, don't eat tortillas no more. No, Natty tells me that already. Okay? Now, you might be here this morning and you feel like, you know what, Pastor, man, I... I think I get it, but my field, my dirt, it's scorched. I mean, it has been run over by a forest fire. Yes, good. Did you know that even though you feel like, man, there's holes, there's cracks, there's like so much stuff, I'm nervous to even dive into that thing. I actually had a person tell me, he goes, man, I don't want to read Pastor Joel's book. It's like, why? It's a great book. It's just because I'm scared that I have to do something. It's like, that's the point, stupid. <laughs> and that's the point of God's word. So we can do something. But you might feel like you're just all messed up. But actually that space, if you're all burned up, you feel scorched, it's the perfect place for, for a fertile ground for a seed to be planted. I was doing a study and it just blew me away of the sequoia tree. I don't know if I have a picture of that. But the sequoia, it's called the General Sherman. It's in California. It's 2,200 years old. A hundred feet round, some say different. It, it's 270 feet tall, 4.2 million pounds. The seed of that particular tree is the size of an oatmeal flake. Just a little seed. And all the seeds, way up at the top, there's a cone that all these seeds are contained in. It's a bunch of seeds in there. The outer casing is up there. And it hardly, it, it contains these seeds and, it, and it, it doesn't release those seeds every year. Sometimes it can stay there 5, 10, 20, up to 50 years, those seeds can stay there. And you know what releases, what, what, what releases those seeds? A forest fire. The forest fire. 
the heat of it, it can contain so much heat, it can bear so much heat, but after everything's brushed away and everything is parched, you know, it gets dried up on the inside. Then it falls to the ground, and when it falls or critters come, it breaks and all the seeds are laid out there. And then in that moisture and in that space, it takes root and it begins the process. So it's beautiful if you're in that space. You might feel frustrated, but maybe that's the, 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 the rhythm or, or the path that God puts you on to get you to this place right now. So don't count yourself out. He's going to sow seed. Don't count your marriage out. Don't count your business out. It's the perfect space for major sequoia tree to come out of this place. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, you are so good to us. We're so thankful. I don't know how this lands. I know how it lands in my heart. And I pray that you would help me and grace me to address the mess, to address the stuff in my own soul so that I could produce and yield according to your perfect will. And I pray for this congregation the same way. We trust you. We declare you Lord over it in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. Amen. Come next week. God bless you. We love you guys. Hey, just remember there's exit signs. I know it gets crowded here right now, but there's exit signs on both ways. Love you. See you Sunday. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.